Howdy, Smith Beetle Ute Builders. Today, this video is on sealing the forward bed wall of a beetle ute as you're building it. We're gonna have a short discussion about some of the materials, and then I'll take you around and show you exactly the different parts and how I use those different materials. This is my technique and my preferences in materials, so take it with a grain of salt. You may like something different, and that's fine. There's a hundred different ways to skin a cat, as they say. So this isn't the only way to go. But I have found that if I follow this technique, I am very surely going to get it sealed and it won't leak. Because as I've said in other videos, there's nothing more disappointing than building a beautiful vehicle and it leaks. And you can't keep it outside. You can't drive it on a rainy day, etc., etc. With that being said, sealing the front bed wall. There are other pieces to ceiling, the rear window, the joint between the rear window surround and the, the bed. Um, this is specifically to that front bed wall, which is the back of the cab. So first, let's talk some of the materials I use. As I said before, there are other options too, but I'm going to show you three or four here. The first one is sealant. My favorite, as I've mentioned before, is the Sikaflex construction sealant. It's available on Amazon, of course, uh, the big box stores, Home Depot, Lowe's, etc. cetera, uh, or, you know, Ace Hardware. I get it at a place called Southern Hardware. It's a little local hardware store that I like. Uh, so that's my favorite. It's between six and eight bucks a tube. Mark Smith is a huge fan of uh, GE Silicone 2. This is good stuff. Um, I am not as big a fan of it. Uh, you got to make sure you prep real well if you use this. It's a, I believe it's a little bit cheaper than the Sikaflex, but it's like within a dollar. So it's not that big a, big a deal. Um, but that is an option. Silicone 2, I would, I would get the 100% Silicone 2 uh, type. Uh, the next step up, which is another material I've started using, is this U-Pole Tiger Sealer. Uh, it's an adhesive sealant uh, for body panels, uh, available in different colors. This one happens to be black. Uh, this is fantastic stuff, and I've actually started using it for sealing between the rear window surround and the bed instead of the 3M uh, window, uh, window adhesive, which is also really cool stuff. Um, this is about $22 bucks a, uh, a tube, and... I get it on Amazon because nobody local has it, uh, but I'm sure it's available other places. Uh, maybe a paint store uh, or a, a, body, uh, a body shop type paint store. So that's another option. Occasionally I have used 3M5200. Now this happens to be a squeeze tube. It is available in a caulking gun tube. Uh, this stuff is incredible. It's designed for below the use of the water line in boats and jet skis. Uh, that's where I became familiar with it. It is, it is awesome stuff. It's a little bit tough to work with. Uh, it sags a little bit. Over time, it takes a long time to cure. Uh, these others that I talked about, they're all around 24 hours to cure. So if you do it one afternoon and then come back the next day, it's all cured and you can start working. This is two or three days curing and it sags a little bit. That can work in your favor. Uh, because it'll seep down into seams that you use it on if you need it to. Uh, it is considered permanent. It's not quite as adhesive quality as, say, panel bond, uh, but it's, it's pretty close. Uh, this stuff is, is amazing stuff. A little bit harder to work with because it's so tacky that it strings out, kind of like melted cheese on your pizza. If you run your finger along it, as you take your finger off, you're going to have this big old string. So it makes a mess, uh, and I, maybe not on this shirt, but on most of my clothes, I have a couple of white strings from using the 5200. Um, a little bit more pricey, it's about 30 bucks in a, uh, a caulking gun size tube. Uh, but if you do a good coverage with this, it is gonna be watertight and it will last, last, last. So on some of the Jettas that I'm trying to fix, that were built by somebody else and then they leaked and I'm trying to help them out and get them sealed, I usually go in with the 5200. 
because it will seep down, it, it'll kind of sag down into the little pinholes of maybe they didn't seal it well enough. Uh, in any case, I don't believe this is necessary uh, if you're doing a clean, fresh build, uh, but it is an option. <clears throat> and for, it's about twice the price, but you know, you're probably gonna use three tubes. So uh, 5200 is great stuff. Just be ready for that super tackiness. Everything you touch, it, it's kind of like anisees. You know, it gets, it'll, it'll get everywhere. So uh, 5200. In general, on a build, I'll use about three tubes. Uh, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less. I tend to be pretty liberal with it. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's my, my technique. Now, I use foam, uh, expanding foam. Uh, and I'll show you in a little bit here where I foam at. Different options for foam. And there's different arguments about it. Some people hate foam because every foam will eventually start to absorb some water. And that's the problem. Once it starts to absorb water, uh, then it holds moisture on the material that it's against. And then you get corrosion. Uh, in general, we don't want anything in the wet exposed areas that will hold water. Most of them skin over and it, it's a matter of how long it takes before it'll start absorbing water. So the various ones that you can get at the hardware store, um, I prefer this one a little bit better than the Good Stuff. I forget what brand makes Good Stuff. This is made by Loctite. Uh, this comes out a little bit firmer. It doesn't expand quite as much as the good stuff and it has a little bit thicker skin on it uh, So it's a little bit more water resistant good stuff does make a waterproof version for doing in ponds and you know, Water features and stuff uh, That's pretty good stuff too. It more resistant to absorbing water uh, if you cut it remember that now you've taken the skin away uh, so sometimes you have to shape it some so that the water will flow the way you want it to. Uh, so remember that if you cut it, you're gonna have to seal that surface with something. Uh, you can use a, a primer, you can use like Flex Seal, actually works pretty well for that. And most of the places that we're using this, it is not a constant water contact. It's an occasional water contact. So the amount of time before this starts absorbing water is pretty long. I mean, we're, we're talking five or 10 years before it's any kind of issue, especially if you put some kind of coating over it, which I do recommend. But my personal favorite is the uh, Coast Guard approved expanding, two-part expanding foam. It's a, it's a urethane base. It's a 50-50. It's a little bit harder to work with because you need to mix equal parts of the two, you know, the, the catalyst, the, the hardener and the uh, resin. Uh, and as soon as you start mixing it, then it starts expanding. So you got to quick pour it in where you want. It's awfully convenient with this that you can stick that nozzle up anywhere you want and, sh -sh 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 and get a little bit of foam in there. And this tends to stay where it's at. Whereas as you're pouring this expanding foam, it's runny. So if you didn't tape all the crevices, it'll start leaking forward into the cab and then it'll start expanding inside the cab, not where you need it. So if you're using this, you gotta make sure you tape all the seams off first to hold the foam where you want it and then it'll start expanding. Uh, so it's a little bit trickier, but the cool thing about this is it, it's a long time before this will start absorbing water. This is what they use in boats and in jet skis, personal watercraft. So it's rated for constant water exposure. Uh, it's available in different poundages, uh, which is basically the density. The higher the poundage, so in this case, this is a four pound, which is kind of the common one. You can't get it in two, eight, 16, etc. cetera. Uh, anyway, the higher poundages are more firm, more dense, but they don't expand as much. So you get more yield from the lighter poundages. I find that this, and by the way, this is from US Composites where I order from, they're down in South Florida, so it's easy for me to get stuff from them. Uh, this is about 45 bucks for this kit, and that's enough for two cars for how much I use so, you know, if you're doing one car, uh, you're going to spend 40 bucks on foam if you go, or 45 bucks on foam if you go this route. Okay, the last thing is I make a, kind of a blanking plate. So this is my template out of cardboard, 
but basically I trace this out on some aluminum and cut that out and then seal those little blank and plates in. Uh, so that's my template. Uh, just start with a piece of paper, get it close and a piece of cardboard, and then you can kind of trace it and trim it till you get it right where you want it. And then you can cut it out of aluminum. The first option is aluminum flashing found in the flashing department at, or roofing department rather, at uh, your favorite hardware store. Comes in a, what's that, about a 10 inch wide roll, and I believe it's 10 feet long. So you'll get plenty in one roll, it's about 10 bucks. I think it's a 28 gauge. The good thing about it is it's aluminum to begin with, so it doesn't corrode much, and then it's epoxy co coated. So you don't have to treat it even, I and mean, you could treat the edge after you cut it, but. Uh, that's a pretty good option. If you want to go a little more rigid than that, you can get this uh, 18 gauge aluminum. And I find this in, again, it comes in different rolls. In the section at the hardware store for doing screens, um, in my area, a lot of people have sunrooms. Uh, and so they do below the screens, they use this. Uh, so it's a little bit heavier gauge aluminum, and like I said, it's epoxy coated, same as the other. Uh, so that works pretty well. So those are my options for making those blanking plates. So let's take the camera off, and we'll go walk around and look down into the car so you can see exactly the bits that we want to make sure we get sealed up and different techniques for getting to those bits. The primary piece is this seam right down along here. And then depending on your, how you feel about it, maybe doing something here to keep water from running out to the sides. Okay, there's a couple different ways to handle it, but either way, the first step is sealing this front bed wall to the, what used to be the seat pan here. And there's a couple of holes that you gotta do also. So my first step, before I even start building the bed. I've cut the car, I've finished the wiring. The next thing I do is seal all these holes and this seam across here. It comes across here, swoops up in a half moon shape across here, half moon shape up above the fuel. The fuel tank is accessed through here and then continues underneath the wire that's the leads to Depending on your model car, it may be a fuel sender or it may be a fuel pump also. Either way, make sure you snap off the little plastic tabs from this wire harness protector here and pull it up a little bit so you can seal the seam underneath. So this, there's a kind of an A-shaped piece of steel here that is spot welded onto the pan. And the holes that you'll see they're already filled, so I should have snapped a couple pictures of that before. But you can see these mobs of sealant. Those were holes that led into the cab, even if this wall is sealed well at this seam. So you gotta seal those holes. And there's one of them that, I believe it's on this one, on the seat holder. The hole is halfway up underneath. So you can drill the spot welds and pop that thing off. I often have. On this one, I didn't. I make little, you know, half inch, square aluminum blanking plates put some sealant around it push the little blanking plate on and then dab sealant on top of it to make sure it seals real well that's my first step and i highly recommend getting that done early on so then you're not stepping in the sealant because it's not cured yet or whatever have you and it's a whole lot easier before you start putting the bed on and when you look at the car without the bed, it's easy to see how those holes lead into the cab. You don't wanna seal them on the inside of the cab because if you do get some moisture in them, then it'll sit in there and rust uh, because it won't have any way to drain or to dry out. So it's important to seal them from this side where it would get water. An additional point here, this seam on some cars looks very tight. Uh, but if you look closely, especially at the top here and the top of it here in these half moon shapes, you'll see a little gap. And it is surprising how much water will make it up the hill from this low point, right? Here's the low point and the drain plug that we pull. It's surprising how much water can make it up and seep through that and into your cab. 
So take a couple of extra minutes and a little bit of sealant and seal that up real well. You may have to take this cover plate off to get that seam real well. I, I recommend making sure you get that seam real well. And again, you have to cut or break off the little tabs that come forward from this harness protector and fill those holes also. There's one about here and one about here. So make sure you get all those holes filled. All right, that's step one. Then I build my bed and I build the bed without this front, uh, front floor panel in. So on the Smith Performance site, uh, it's recommended that you build it with it. Uh, and that works really well for building the car. My preference is that I really wanna make sure I get that seam sealed well because I do not want my car to leak or a customer's car to leak. So I take preference over the ceiling than the ease of building the bed and setting it in. So I build the bed without that front panel in it, the front floor panel that has the access hole. You'll recognize it because it has the hole right here. And I set the bed in. I make sure I do all my trial fitting with the fiberglass quarter panels to make sure I'm getting the bed where I want it. But I, before I bolt the bed all the way down, like bolting in uh, these built B pillars and the bolts that go uh, up under here and here on each side, and then of course the uh, by the bumper. Once I am confident that I can put that bed exactly where I want it so that when I slide the fiberglass quarter panels on, my height and uh, gaps are gonna come out perfect, then I drill the holes from inside the car through the front panel wall and into the steel. I stick a couple of, you can take a screwdriver and lever it open or a little plastic wedge or whatever you got laying around. I wedge it open just a little bit, shoot a gob of sealant in there all the way across, and then pop all those rivets. And then once I pop those rivets, I come back with another bead and smear it out real well to make sure there's no gaps. And you can see, looking close, that we've got a pretty good seal there. Okay, so then you have the front bed wall put in. You're almost ready to put the floor in. I like to do these little filler panels. So this is, I cut this out of aluminum and then I run three or four rivets. As you can see, there's a rivet there, there, there. There's no load on it, so I'm really not worried about the load and the sealing needs to be done at the bottom. So you can see I've run a big bead on the bottom there and I use a lot of sealant because that gives the bottom strength and there is a plug so back to what plugs you pull, the inner smaller plugs is what you pull for a drain, right? So that one, you can actually see the ground through it. This one on the passenger side right here, that's actually the top of the fuel tank, but the fuel tank is plastic and that's a fairly low point on the top of the fuel tank. So it drains well up over the fuel tank. So let me walk around the other side of the car and we'll look at that from the outside and you can see the other piece that I did with it. Now, this is my technique. There's a lot of different ways to address this. But here we are looking. So the brown, that's that aluminum panel. You can see the rivets I popped in it. And then the bead of sealant I ran on this side. You can see the placement. I tucked it down below this plug, which you don't want to pull that plug because it leads into the frame. And you really don't want water draining into your frame. But that gives this panel a little bit of rigidity leaning up against the outside lip of that panel. Ran it up all the way. So that's what this looks like at that stage. I also made a couple little blanking plates out of that same aluminum, and I really can't get you a shot of it because it's underneath this wire here. There's a cavity, there's an opening there, and then I put a little bit, a little dab of sealant. It's four inches by an inch and a half. I put some sealant along the edge of it, push it up there, let it cure, and then later on when I pour foam in here, that will support it from the backside and it won't go anywhere. And that will help, that little blanking plate will keep, if you do pour foam, it'll keep foam from running into the cab, which I'll show you on the other side, I, I missed a little bit. Um, and it helps you 
seal up that around those wires better. This side is a very is is a much smaller uh, wire bundle going through, and I already started doing some of the bracing here, so you still won't be able to see that blanking plate, but it is right under these wires. You may be able to see the brown on the back side. So that's that little blanking plate. So you seal up from both sides and this becomes fairly rigid. So the idea is that water that collects into the bed runs through into this floor pan and goes out through those two drains. That's what's gonna happen. The front of the bed is a little bit lower than the back of the bed, so water will tend to run forward in the bed and then come down. So that aluminum, I guess you'd call a blanking plate or whatever you wanna call it, that keeps the water from running into the sides down into this cavity. Some people will just foam this and you can, as long as you foam it up high enough that water won't run over it, you'll be fine. This area is low and leads to the cab. So if you get moisture in that area, it's gonna drain into the cab. But now I'm gonna do a little more foam work in this side. I haven't I wanted to do the video before I got the foam all in there and you couldn't see anything. So that's my technique of filling this. My personal opinion is the problem most people run into is that they don't get this seam across here sealed and they don't get these little holes sealed up. And those lead directly into the cab. So let me see if we can, I didn't think about filming from the cab. So here we are looking inside. So that hole there is where the water will come out if you didn't seal the holes in. I run an extra bead after I get the wall all riveted in. And here you can see a little bit of that blanking plate. That's the blanking plate. So I'm still gonna run a little more sealant across these seams here. I'm still letting a little bit of this cure up. So that's my techniques on sealing up the front bed wall and making sure water that gets in the floor pan doesn't end up into the cab. Thanks for watching. I hope this gives you some ideas and helps you with your build. If you have better ideas or you have another technique or another uh, adhesive or something that you like to use, go ahead and put it in the comments to share it with the next guy that watches the video or gal. Appreciate you watching. Take care. Be good to each other.